Hey all, this is O1 Turbo Crew and Professional Jackass Jarek here. And we're coming at <laughs> you uh, in uh, my I finally got a new webcam for my friend uh, Simon E's computer who was awesome in building this with me and I'm I'm also hoping that this is correct, but uh, maybe it's just uh it's a full screen thing and not the same setup, but it seems also wider, I've noticed, Jarek, so that's that's cool to me too. Production values. <gasps> they have learning. they have gone up. But yes, we are here to get with the uh, third episode of twenty four. Oh my god, there's not that much glare. This will be good for future projects. <laughs> I love it. I mean it's still there, but it doesn't seem as bad. Hey, look at that. We got rid of the JJ Abrams effect. I wonder <laughs> Oh, you know you, you know why? Now I know why it was, because we're obviously getting the light off the screen, so now that makes sense. When we're here, you can see it, and if we need to, we can turn it, and you can still get it. But yeah, we are continuing 24 Season 1, and I believe we did hours 1 a.m. through 2 a.m. And uh, in this one, uh, stuff gets even, uh, get even a bit more real. Not so much high on the... Um, action quotient much like the last episode per se but dang oh dang does it get uh real in this one didn't it jerk yeah this is what i love about 24 is honestly to me some of the best scenes are actually not the action scenes but the setups to them where you learn about what's been going on people are making connections shit's happening behind the scenes honestly this is the stuff i fucking love but uh might be a hard sell for some people who are all the all about the action. Yeah, well, again, it's drama, espionage, and stuff like that. Like, like I've told folks, it is like watching James Bond, but taking a more serious view of it. Here comes Hawk. Or, you know, to explain it to all you uh, video gamers and you weeaboos out there. If you, if you want, you can let him up, Joe, oh, yeah, because yeah. I, I know him. Come here. Yeah, the difference would basically be the difference between Metal Gear Solid and Siphon Filter. If anybody remembers Siphon Filter. Yeah. And, you know, so it's nothing really has that sort of vibe to it. But with this hour, you know, Jack is on his way back into CTU. He, if you remember, he just discovered that we had found out that Nina's name was on the key card. He also takes the uh, broken, bloody, cut-off fingerprint that he had, which uh, I don't know how he was able to get clear fingerprints for that because he still saw there was blood around it, so... Continuity goof, I guess, but oh well, nothing uh, too bad. But <laughs> as you can imagine, you know, as Hawk is climbing behind us, cute. But other than that, um, you know, he was able to get fingerprints off the guys. Unfortunately, later in the episode, we find out these guys have been completely wiped off the map, and there's no known uh, connection to them. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you know, like 24 points out, You'd have to be in a pretty high up position or in a pretty important position in the right type of agency to have that done. Yeah, and since we're starting with uh, Jack's escapades, you know, Jack uh, is just going back to CTU. He tells uh, Jamie, the one person Richard Walsh said he could trust of, you know, like what it, what it means and what happened to him. Uh, Jamie apparently was really close with Richard Walsh. She's like almost trying to fight back tears, but doing her best to keep a straight face, which uh, she did uh, She did pretty dang good, and I got to admit that's really good. And, you know, you know what I realized? I did not get any of the cast and crew up again. I will remember that again for next time, folks, so we can be a little bit more fair to the cast. But, um, yeah, she, uh, she was uh, giving a uh, raw emotion with it and held a lot of it back. But she says, you know, hey, uh, if you if I give you time, can you check Nina's computer with this key card? And she's like, well, yeah, I can do it, but I need time in Nina's desk. And uh, Jack devises a plan to have uh, basically Nina give uh, Tony her work and that they would uh, talk together. And Jack has sometimes a bit of an ingenious plan when it comes to these things. Basically, he calls Nina up to the office after she gives her work to Tony and they're going about all their stuff, and then, you know, it's like he's trying to talk to her, you know, uh, um, shoot, oh, yeah, Jamie goes over to Jack's, or to Dina's computer to insert the key card, and he says, are you seeing Tony? Jack, you really want to talk about that now? I thought we were over this. Well, 
I just wanted to know if it was serious. Well, of course it's not serious. And then there's this great banter back and forth, which is just, it's random to bring up right now, but he's doing it to keep her in the office to play the, the old jealous boyfriend to seem like if it's something huge. And then she keeps wanting to walk away, and Jamie keeps signaling to Jack, no, no, I need a little bit more time, I'm not ready. And then, you know, he brings up something else that gets her going, and, you know, it's just a cool thing that they do. And Jamie eventually gets the information, Jack lets Nina go. Jamie tells Jack that, yeah, the card definitely originated from Nina's computer. So, you know, it's like, uh-oh, big, huge thing right there that's like, whoa. Well, you know, and it's a great play on Jack's part because throughout the first two episodes, everybody is giving both of them grief over this. You know, Tony's giving her grief. He's giving Jack grief. Everybody's like, everybody's kind of been on it. They know they've, they've you know, clearly been seeing each other. But the thing is, you know, it's one of those workplace taboos. Everybody does it. You know, you're not supposed to talk about it. it, it <laughs> destabilizes the work environment but uh it's a great it was a great play for jack to pull because you know of course you know she's got her emotions riled up because tony's giving her shit about it he, she knows he's been riled up about it it's honestly it just shows how brilliant jack really is he knows exactly how to hit those little points and you're gonna see more of his awesome interrogation skills later on trust me yeah well and to that point since we usually go into the segments and continue each character throughout their thing. So later on, as the show continues, Jack actually uh, corners Nina inside uh, inside the meeting room where they meet and debrief and do things, and I guess where they also have coffee and drinks and everything ready. Uh, Nina looks like she's making a new batch of coffee. Jack comes in with this look of pure disgust on his face. Like, I, I know that has an hour look, but he's basically zeroing in on her like I believe it's you and you know like basically she's just talking to him with regular banter and then all of a sudden he grabs her by the shoulders throws her into an office chair and says who are you working for you know and it's like he basically doesn't start off that strong but it eventually gets that strong to where she's like I have no idea what you're talking about it's not me and then he's then he mentions how you know agents have died people are this and that and how long have you been playing me you know I think you're dirty. The key card came from your computer. She does her best to defend herself and says, you know, Jack, this isn't me. I don't know what's going on. You're delusional. And basically it's left up to Jamie to go through uh, Nina's log to see when the key card was done. And then, you know, they're going through all the logs, the dates, the date and times. And I believe it was, yeah, it was January 14th, I believe, of whatever, of... Obviously, uh, I believe this uh, season actually does take place in 2001. So it was January 14th of 2001, obviously. And then, um, like, something clicks with Nina, and then it clicks with Jack. And it's like, we were in a... What did they say? Bahamas or Aruba? I think it was Aruba, wasn't it? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I think they did say Aruba. It was like, we were in Aruba that week together, Jack. And then all of a sudden, you know... Um, Jack's like, oh crap, what did I do? And then, you know, but Jack, who's still in his mode, is saying, well, okay, Nina, if it wasn't you, you know, someone hacked your system, we got to look into this. And then she's like, you know, Jack, I understand you want to find this guy, but how could you? You should have known better. And, you know, she leaves. Jack is still trying to check the computer, but he gives this look of, you know, damn it, what have I done? You know, Nina's all flustered. So that basically leaves all of that for, you know, next time down the road because obviously there's something big going on. Oh, but I forget, we could probably do it for this one because, you know, Tony basically plays the level-headed guy in this episode, taking on the tasks that Nina and Jack give him. But we see how, after all that discussion of Nina not being the rat continues, Tony pulls a very interesting thing out of his hand. He calls what seems to be Division CTU, and he's like, yeah... Division, I just want to say I think Jack Bauer needs to be removed. Be needs to be removed from duty, and it's like, oh, stirring the pot is Tony. So again, that clever characterization of you really don't know who to trust and who there is because Tony's really 
looking like he has an axe to grind. And could it be because he's concerned about Nia and his division, or could it be something else very sinister? Well, you know, and also, like, them finding out that the key card was encoded while they were in Ruba kind of indicates that, A, you know, somebody had access to your terminal while you were gone, and B, somebody with, with a pretty good degree of computer skills or knowledge of the organization and the security clearances would have had to be the one to do it. So that kind of like gives you an idea of who to look for, but it doesn't exactly tell you exactly who. It's like, could be a number of individuals, but which one and why would they have the motive? Which is what I love about this episode. You know, it just gives you all these enticing possibilities, but mm -hmm. it doesn't flat out state it. And, uh, and as we can probably continue, since that sort of ended that scene... Um, you can basically tie the two scenes together because Terry and Alan York uh, really didn't have a huge lot to do with this one. But um, they, you know, they talked to Jack again. They, they, Alan York and uh, Terry Bauer seem to agree that, you know, they're going to wait for the girls to come back home and do their thing. Jack thinks that's not a good idea because he says you don't know what uh, condition Kim and Janet will be in. So in a, in a little bit of a rough convincing way which terry caught on to terry was saying jack don't be rough about this but jack was firm and a little rough with alan york saying you know it's a rough neighborhood they're in a bad part of la you and terry should wait for the girls to come back alan york seems like he sees the point but reluctantly almost concedes that you know the wait for the girls they're waiting you know in the uh, department store uh or furniture store for the time being meanwhile you have uh um, Terry and, uh, or no, Kim and Janet with Dan and Rick waiting at what looks to be another type of airport because apparently that's where they're going to meet Ira Gaines to uh, deliver Kim, it sounds like. Kim seemed like, from what they were saying, was the main catch. So again, uh oh, does someone know about Bauer's connections or past or did something happen with this? It just thickens with this too. But all of a sudden, you know, you have things where you know, Janet's coming to, and if you remember, we said in, in the last episode, um, right before Janet comes to, she was given uh, heroin to help with her broken arm since she was in pain. Uh, or basically, you should say, remove from the bone arm, because, like, the bone almost looks like it's sticking out of her arm from the skin from where Dan hit her. But she's, like, waking up and gaining consciousness, and then, and then she's like... You know, oh, we were having a good time with Dan. And she's like, well, no, Dan broke your arm. No, he didn't. And then she looks down and she's like, oh, my arm. Like, you know, the realization hits her. And, you know, Kim's trying to tell Janet that they need to escape. You know, Dan and Rick's talking. Rick's giving Dan a hard time because he's saying, you know, you're letting these girls control you. You're being weak, blah, blah, blah. So they're arguing. But while they're arguing, which obviously two stupid guys who were new at this, which... Makes you wonder if Ira Gaines knew what he was doing by picking these two, but hey, hey, you know. Yeah, and clearly one of them is more committed to this task than the others. Yeah. Which, again, mm -hmm. kind of goes back to those two girls and the uh, the identity card from the uh, airplane. You know, mm -hmm. one girl's totally in on this shit, the other one's just kind of the uh, friend. Which we, which we will get to next. That'll be the next point to get at. And with that, you know... Um, Kim and Janet actually take off and run across the airfield. They get a head start across uh, Rick and Dan. They're temporarily blocked by a plane on the runway that was taken off. And, you know, Janet and Kim just missed that plane. And, you know, they're running throughout the streets of L.A. Like, I guess they're near Central Street, a couple other streets in L.A. I don't know which, but they're near a place. Uh, I believe they say in the show it's, Platt, it's Platt's Auto Body. They're near. And, you know, they're running around. All of a sudden, there's this... Uh, homeless guy who's a drug dealer who they run into. Uh, they say really quick in the show his name's Rogal. So, you know, Rogal's trying to sell something to somebody, but they scare the seller off and the seller runs away. Rogal's upset with them. Janet and Kim are asking Rogal for help and Rogal's like, well, no, you need to pay up. And basically takes money off of Kim, takes money off of Janet, steals uh, Janet's necklace and, you know, he takes off in a back area inside what looks to be these abandoned buildings. Janet and Kim follow him, and, you know, Dan and Rick are, like, almost right behind him at all times. And, you know, the, the tension in these scenes was done really well, filmed really well, acted really well by all the people involved. There's actually a part, though, where Janet and Kim 
run into Rogal again, and Rogal was like, you're in my spot. Kim, you know, Kim almost, I, I never noticed this uh, the last couple times I've watched this, but it looks like when they run into Rogal, Kim wants to leave. Janet actually holds on to Kim's arm, forcing Kim back, and then I think it was Janet who said, is there a phone we can use? Rogal's like, no, and then like, you know, they're like, Kim's begging Rogal to help him, you know, hey, is there anything you can do? Is there any way we can get to a phone? Or like, are the police nearby anything? And Rogal's like, you know, no, there's nothing. Would you would you guys, you know, like me to take you to the foothills so you can curl up all nice with daddy? And, you know, like, he basically gets upset with them because he sees how these two girls live a better life than him. And it's like, you know, you don't, it's like a quick thing if you don't know, like, how it's like, on the streets, and then I think it's like Janet who asks really nicely again, is there a phone nearby? Rogo just shakes his head like this, like being nice, but then Kim sort of begs him one more time. He's like, go, just get out of here. And they take off running again. Suddenly near the end, they actually run into, I'm going to say it sounds like a booker because it seems like he was talking about a fighter. They go up to this booker and, you know, he's, getting all sensual and sexual with them, which, which is disturbing. And, you know, but it seems like he's about to grab J Janet and Kim. Rogal comes out of nowhere, starts hitting on the guy. The guy starts hitting Rogal back, and then Dan and Rick run into this guy. It almost looks like they're going to fight each other, and then they're like, ah, forget it. And poor Rogal looks like he's going to get beaten to death by this booker. They take off running. All of a sudden, you know, Kim gets a little bit behind Janet. Janet's begging Kim to come on. Janet sadly gets hit by a car. And then, you know, Kim's trying to revive her saying, come on, come on, you know, no, please, no. And then they grab Kim. They, you know, take off of Kim. Dan's like, what about her? And Rick's like, you know, or no, Dan, yeah, Dan's like, what about her? And the, Or no, Rick is like, what about her? And Dan's like, forget it. You know, we'll leave her. And so, you know, Janet's there on the street. And this is near the end of the episode, so they're playing up the fact that Janet's probably dead, but right at the end of the episode, she opens her eyes, takes a breath, and she's thankfully still alive, but the poor girl. <laughs> and you know, I don't know if this song was uh, from that time period, but if anybody remembers this little ditty, listen up, listen up, there's a devil in the church, put a bullet in the chamber because this is going to hurt. Yeah, anybody remember that one? That one's about heroin use. <laughs> and, and also, I think the reason why Jack uh, told him to stay with the car, and this is probably more of a Jack thing that they really wouldn't get, but if these guys were like professional criminals and, you know, maybe they like sold them off to white slavery or butchered them for their kidneys or whatever, they might come back for the car and try to pawn that off at the <laughs> shop. So, you know, if they're there, they can get a good look at the guys, get an identification, maybe a license plate number. It, I mean, kind of just a thing co a cop would do. You know, it's like, stay with the car, there's a good chance they might come back for it. Yes, and, you know, you reminded me, Jarek. Thank you. I forgot about that really quick scene because I think, yeah, yeah, I had it written here. And uh, um, Kim actually gets a hold of the booker's phone after Rogal started hitting him and attacking him. She makes a quick call to her mom. Uh, uh, Terry and Alan York are freaking out. You know, they say where they're at, and, you know, Terry helps call the cops for Janet and Kim, and they're taken off towards Platt's auto body, and then that's when all the stuff happens and Kim gets taken again. So Janet and, or Alan York and Tilly are on their way there, but just a little too late, but she got a hold of her mother and, you know, warned them that, you know, no, me and Janet were kidnapped, we're in trouble, you know, please help us call the cops, and yeah, da, da, da. So I did forget there was a little bit more with Alan York and Terry there, so they're on their way to Platt's auto body, but just a little... Too late, sadly. And uh, now we can probably bet this is probably a good time to go into it. Yes, we get to Ira Gaines again. And, you know, Mandy and uh, Mandy's friend, Bridget. Uh, basically, you know, there's a scene where they're talking. And, you know, obviously Bridget and Mandy are talking. Mandy's like, you don't know these people. Why are you screwing around with them? Just give them the key card. We could end up dead. And she's like, oh, but I know what I'm doing. We can increase our... Chances by two million. Come on, this is easy. We'll play. We'll play these guys. We'll get more money. A million for you. A million for me. And then there's all. And then there's a scene where Mandy's concerned. But then, obviously, you know, they start making out together. So obviously, Bridget and Mandy have a relationship with each other. And you know, after that, you know, Mandy says, you know, okay, let's do it. And then she's like, well, okay, we'll go talk to him. No, 
let me do it. And then Mandy gets up and then Bridget says this line, you're always looking out for me. And then, obviously... And then she also tells her, it's like, but it's no, it's nothing but money to them. And then the other one says, oh, like, yeah, but it's 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 always nothing but money with them. Yep. And in a way, that's true, because all these things always involve money. And, and I will say, guys, um, to to this show, I mean, it, it is true. There's always something involving money or some sort of power scale and just power. So gr greed and power, but also with some of these things, because. I know this show is old, so it doesn't really reflect today. Today, I think it's money, power, legacy, and just wanting to be in the history books. But, I mean, you know, it just, the show really makes you look at and see how everything just dabbles in with money. And it's really like, you know, money really does talk to a lot of these people, and it's hilarious how that's so. But, you're right, Jared, they set that up. Ira Gaines basically puts the money in Bridget's account. Uh, to where, which uh, they don't say it, but it's offshore island accounts, so way, way to avoid naming the island there. I thought that was funny, but I'm going to say more than likely Cayman Islands, since that's always a place where illegal money goes. But, you know, they're off to get the key card. All of a sudden, you know, they want to grow, you know, Gaines wants to bring his whole group, but Manny's like, uh-uh, Ira, only the three of us, so me, me, you, and me, me, you, and me, me, Bridget and you will go and then you know they're checking out you know Gaines and Gaines does this sensual week to wing to Mandy since you know Matt or no Bridget because Mandy's feeling up all his parts and they obviously do a shot to the crotch and that's when he winks at Bridget Bridget is just sort of unfazed <laughs> like this but like Jarek was saying you sort of get the thing like he's teasing her because it, it also seems like Mandy did stuff with Ira Gaines on the side too so yeah but they take off in the Jeep, get the key card, they, they unbury the key card, um, which seems to be like right outside this abandoned oil field, it looks like in California. And then as soon as I get the key card, you have Mandy and Bridget lock hands are walking together. All of a sudden you hear this loud shot ring out and then you hear the bullet hitting Bridget. Bridget just falls down and then all of a sudden you have Mandy look off to the distance, almost like she's looking at him. But... Ira Gaines had set up the uh, look-alike, uh, yeah, look look-alike Martin Belkin, who I believe his name's Jonathan, still played by the same guy Rudolph Martin. But you know, Jonathan has a shot lined up for Mandy, and then Ira Gaines goes, "So that job that summer, you in?" And then you know, she we see tears are visibly coming from her eyes, and she just says, "Yeah," really softly, goes to the car. And they're taking off. She looks one one more time back at Bridget. And Ira Gaines just looks at her with, shockingly, a bit of a sympathetic face saying, you had no choice. And they take off as you see Bridget's body just lying there on the ground. Oops. I guess main squeeze became side hoe after all. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and believe me, always sometimes what I've learned from the show, always pay attention to the characters they put in because the continuity in the show is pretty damn good, so I'll even say that for you, Jarek, for the seasons and parts you've missed. Just pay attention to all the characters you see, because you never know who may be returning. Yes, yeah, or who may be connected elsewhere. Spoiler warning, kiddos. This is the uh, TV equivalent of the Wheel of Time book series. That 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 is good, even though even though the even though the book series even though fantasy mixed with a bit more reality. But hey, who's counting? And then probably for the final thing is we'll have um, this one where we go to Senator Palmer because his story is sort of the side story, but you can see where it's all intersecting. You have Sherry Palmer, uh, Penny Johnson, Gerald, talking with uh, Aaron Pierce, uh, who's head of Secret Service, and, you know, she's saying, but why is this happening now? And, and he's like, man, we get threats, you know, designated all the time, so, you know, all, all we've been told is that we're here to protect your husband and that there's a threat that's been escalated. Um, Palmer's son, Keith, is worried about him, saying, you know, I think he went down to a cafe, I'll go get him, and, you know, Pierce is like, son, we can't allow you to do that, because we take, we take the threat on the senator's life directed to the whole family, we can't let you leave, and you can see Keith really cares about his father, because he doesn't want to let the Secret Service stop him, and, you know, Sherry is trying to stop her son, you know, Aaron Pierce is trying to still stop him. He eventually concedes, but you can see there's a really good relationship with Keith. 
in his father. And the reason that is, is wait to the future episodes, but you actually get the idea coming up because we see where Palmer went. Palmer went to this one seedy hotel or building. It's like got graffiti all over it. It's very dingy, grungy, and, you know, Palmer's waiting in the car, and he sees there's these two teen hoodlums smashing out headlights and back lights of cars. They're whooping, hooping, and hollering all the way through. It's a white kid and a black kid, both. He gets out of the car, just taking care of it, just sort of nodding, but yet he, it looks like he has his guard up because he knows he has to be careful around these two. All of a sudden, um, both of them see him, and the black kid's like, hey, homie, you know, it's 50 bucks to park here. You got to pay the toll. And he's like, oh, so you're in charge here? Yeah, man, 50 bucks, cough it up. And then the white kid goes, yo, dude, I know who that guy is. Yeah, you're that senator guy, Palmer, right? And then he's like, and he's like, no, that's not me. Well, yeah, it is you. And then, you know, typical black kid plays it up and says, you know, hey, what you going to do for me, Mr. President? What you going to do for me? And he's like, see, that's your problem. You're always wanting others to fix your problem. What are you going to do to fix yourself? Whoops. It's okay. <laughs> we say hope. But yeah, he's like, what are you going to do for yourself? And then he's like, man, you're talking like you know me. You know what? I was in your situation when I was younger, so I know more than you think. You keep this up, you're going to be dead in five years. Very strong and powerful words. And... Folks, I hate to say this, Senator Palmer was not wrong. Well, I mean, he's basically Bizarro Universe Barack Obama. The president we we uh, need, but don't deserve. Yeah, and you know what I mean? Given how it's LA again, that's why I'm saying it. Considering how it turns out, <coughs> you know, course, Palmer's probably not wrong about that. <laughs> and of course, the stupid shit like doesn't like the idea. He just got called out by somebody who's already been there. So he's like, you know what? Welcome to the jungle, Mr. President. You're going to die. But this guy just catches it one hand. Is, and this just shows you, you know, Palmer really has been there. Because, kid, if you had a sh fucking shot, you would have done it already. Well, yeah, but then after Palmer stops him from being hit from the bat, he just looks at him, giggles, and just sort of, like, smashes his, his uh, mirror out. Sadly, um, even though we don't see it, you see where Palmer looks at his hand, he's rubbing it, and then he, like, sucks on his palm, so he probably got cut up a little bit from the glass. All of a sudden, we see the guy he was talking to over the phone, Carl, who's played by a, a great underrated actor, in my opinion, Zach Granier, come out, and he's like, so what'd you get me out of 2 a.m. for, David? Maureen Kingsley's making up lie, lies about Keith. He, she's say, or, 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 no, she's saying that, you know, during the rapist, um, you know, the rapist Lyle Gibson was pushed. And he's like, so somebody pushed Lyle Gibson. And to give you guys context, because we haven't got into it, as you can see, this is a black family. The person who raped Nicole and died was a man named Lyle Gibson who was white. So you can see where this case is a conflict of interest. And then the thing is, you know, but uh, Carl's going, so someone pushed Lyle Gibson, whatever. And, you know, he, he basically snaps at Carl saying, she says it was Keith. And, you know, like, Carl's like, oh, crap, this is, you know, bigger than we thought. And, like, Carl's trying to calm Palmer down, saying, hey, you know what? It's it's your competition. They're probably doing this. They're just trying to set you up. Let me take care of this. Let me have, have it. And he's like, well, I don't care what my competition says or Marine Kingsley says. It's a lie. And he's like, David, let me handle this. We go back this a few years. Remember, you're the one who shakes the hand, kisses the babies, does all the senator stuff. Remember, this is why you hired me to do the dirty stuff. Let me do this for you. I'll call you back in an hour. So as you can see, just after two episodes, that thing that upset Palmer comes to life. His son, Keith, possibly killed somebody. So pretty and, interesting intrigue. And you have to remember, this was like, what, five, maybe six years after the OJ trial? So... Again, this is another clever play, because if I remember, you know, like that white guy who got pulled out of the truck and beat, beat the fuck up by those four black kids, I think that was somewhere, like, wasn't it either L.A. or somewhere outside of it? You know, I, I can't remember where it was, but I think, I think you're right. But again, 2001, like you said a few years ago from some of those incidents, very taboo subject, but I give a... Uh, I give the writers, I think it was Michael Losef and Joel Cernow who wrote this episode, I give them credit for 
doing such a taboo thing and making it intriguing because you're like, even though we're worried about the senator's life, this whole thing involving his family is now like, oh shit, where is this going to go? So it's like, whoa, what a big thing. And you know, Carl says he's going to take care of it. He'll call him in an hour. Secret Service actually found out where he was. And Palmer goes back to, uh, to, to, with them to be peaceful with it. And, uh, as you can see, that is basically the episode in, in a nutshell, breaking it down. Huge intrigue pieces and great stuff. Um, characters for this one, I mean, obviously, I'm always going to say it. Kiefer Sutherland, Jack Bauer, great mm -hmm. role, good stuff. I have to give, for this one, I definitely have to give an edge for Dennis Haysbert for that parking lot scene. Senator Palmer for that parking lot scene. Very powerful stuff, great line. When stuff about his son comes to play, he really emotes. He lets out, showing concern for his son and the love for it. And then I have to say as well, if I have to give an edge to another actor in this one, Sarah Clark, Nina Myers, when that whole truth was brought out, oh, she really let out the hurt in that one too. So those are my uh, three characters as always. Uh, Jarek, who are your favorite characters? Yeah, I'm, I, I agree. You know, Jack Bauer again. You know, you just can't go against the Bauer. Uh, Bizarro Obama absolutely stealing the show as the daddy and the family man and frankly the the president we should have had. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of going to go with a bit of a dark horse on this one. I'm going to go with uh, that sleazeball Rugal or Rogel or whatever his name oh, is. Oh, Rogel. Because okay. honestly, you know, he plays a bit of a shitbag a little too well. It's either either he's a damn good actor or <laughs> they just hired him because, you know, he's just doing his thing. I'm just vibing with this part. <laughs> we found you off the street. Ho, ho. <laughs> it's like, can you be an asshole? I live in L.A. Fair enough. You're hired. And um, let's see. And I know we went a little long here, but again, there was a bit to explain in this episode. Again, not a lot of action, but more moving parts, moving the episodes together. So for this one... I loved how it explains the intrigue, it gives more to it. I love how we're getting more into the characters, like, we we get more with Ira Gaines. Um, I will say, not to ruin it for you guys, this is the last we will see of Mandy, so Mandy's part is done, but as you can see, Ira Gaines has the key card, and that's going to continue, where's this going to go, and obviously there was a big loss with her friend Bridget dying. And will we see her again? I will say yes, but I'm not going to say how. So keep an eye out for Manny in future installments. And obviously everything with Jack had built on. The stuff of Palmer was great and built on. So there was a lot of good character building that I loved. Uh, Jack, or, or Jarek, any final thoughts? <laughs> hey, keep your eyes on Tony. Boy's going to be going places in the near future. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, is, is that it? Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. But hey, what do you guys think? Um, is is again? Is this something that you like? And is something that you enjoy? And uh, like, what do you think about Twenty Four? Because I've noticed you guys have been paying attention. We've been getting some views of this. So awesome that you guys know of this. So yeah. I'm actually happy about that. Like, not huge, but the fact that our views have been anywhere between ten to fifteen people. Awesome. But yeah, just let us know down in the comments what you think about 24 and uh, how you think about it. And what do you think of possibly episode, like I said, I think it's, uh, yeah, 2 a.m. Two, or yeah, 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. this episode. I really should i got to remember to write this stuff down. But until then, this is o one 2 bo Jerk the Jackass. And we will see you guys again later, right? And hope you like also the new location. Deuces.